Good afternoon. I realized I was about to start in Dutch, and then I think, well, no, that's not a contract. I'm supposed to speak in, uh, in, in English. Um, today's subject will be somewhat related to um, last times. Last times we thought of, we, we discussed about the different types of, um, of crimes or that are maybe related to financial world but also to um, not only crimes, but also temptations, um, strategies. When I say strategies, I have in particular in mind strategies to have some laws which may be damaging to your business being removed or preventing some laws which are being considered from being passed into law or then, if they are passed into law, implemented. And um, today we'll be discussing more specifically the relationship between the regulator and the, um, and the financial world. The regulator being that instance of a um, public with the meaning of being organized by the state, by government, in order to supervise the um, operation of the um, financial world. The regulator has a number of functions and duties, like gathering information about the um, financial world in order to be sure that transparency in the operation does exist, which raises immediately the issue of uh, what is called shadow banking, which is lightly or not at all regulated. Some of the operation of the financial world doesn't fall within the compass, I would say, of the, uh, of the regulator's um, duties and, um, and functions. Gathering information also, as within the um, dominant mainstream economic theory, information uh, allows the um, a perfect symmetry of information, making it possible for buyer and seller, borrower and lend lender to be on an equal footing when dealing with um, financial operations. Also, another function of the regulator is to prevent um, the development of systemic risk. And as you may know, um, the regulator has been particularly poor all over the world in doing that in the period that led to the, um, to the financial uh, meltdown of 2008, of the autumn fall of 2008. Um, the notion, the, if you look at the literature, if, you, if it were possible to do a Google search according to time to history, you would see that in the period leading to 2008, um, the notion of systemic risk would come up with very few entries on the, um, on the web. Starting in 2008, um, many, um, many items would come to the, could, to the view. There was, the reason why is that there was, and I hinted to that before, there might have been within economic theory or financial theory, the notion that systemic risk was very difficult to um, define. That it would be very difficult to delineate exactly what is systemic risk and what uh, would, be, um, would not be. Um, I would say it's essentially the development of an approach to e economics developed by physicists that has drawn our attention to what is systemic risk. And essentially because it's by using methods on economic data, which are borrowed like typically seismology, the um, study of earthquakes. I'm thinking in particular of the um, work by Didier Sornet, a, um, a French a physicist who, uh, who was my, my colleague of sorts in uh, Los Angeles and who is now at, um, in Zurich at the um, Polytechnic um, Institute who studied um, 
some financial processes as being um, critical processes. A critical process is a process f of a physical nature such that a catastrophe is likely to happen. A, a, a critical process is difficult to spot first, and then once you've spotted it, you are within a critical process, it's impossible to actually say when the catastrophe may develop. The only certainty, once you have defined a process as being critical, is that a catastrophe will happen at some point. Um, a typical example of a critical process is that of, um, of kids building a, um, a sand castle, not not sand castle, but just a heap of, of, of sand, and trying to make it as, as high as possible. The process can be um, envisaged in reverse when, when, when digging a hole. You know that if you dig a hole in the sand, at some point the whole thing will, will collapse. It's very difficult to tell exactly why, but the same, same thing happens when you uh, make a, a heap of sand just by adding sand. At some point, there will be some kind of avalanche developing. At some point, there will be a whole uh, part of the, uh, a whole cliff within the um, sand, cast, sand um, heap that will um, suddenly collapse. But the fact is, it's, it's totally impossible to predict when. Why? Because the determination is, is linked to, you would have actually to examine every single piece of dust, every speck of sand, in, in order to know exactly when, 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 when a catastrophe would develop. A, a very small effect will actually then produce a, um, a tragical um, catastrophe or dis disaster. Um, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of that, what happened at the, um, on that particular day, um, which must have been the 14th of, uh, of September 2008, when the, um, when the people um, gathered in order to examine what would happen if uh, there was a, a bankruptcy, if, if, um, if Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11, if the uh, bankruptcy was decided for that, that firm, they, they reviewed a number of possible consequences of that, that decision. And the fact is that, and I think I've mentioned, mentioned that, they reviewed like, like 15 items, that things that may happen go wrong, but they did not mention the one they did actually, uh, which was the, um, the collapse of the um, money markets in the, um, in the, in the following, following day. So the notion of, of systemic risk is being explored now. And as I just mentioned, it's unfortunately, the, the literature on the subject is very, very thin within uh, economic, uh, economic theory, economics um, as, as, as such. And it is left now essentially for people who are outside of that field to uh, come up with uh, suggestions. Uh, mentioning the, um, the Zurich Institute, Polytechnic Institute, um, we, have a, um, we have a very interesting study by uh, Mr. Battiston and some of his collaborators uh, that managed to produce for the first time a picture of the um, interconnection of the financial firms and firms all together in, in, in the world, showing that the, the connection is so tight within all these firms in terms of decision making, of decision being made. The, the terms he's, they're using is that of control. Um, there are so few people within that system that they are controlling such a wide extent of the system as, as such that the system is actually not being made rob robust by, by that, but quite the contrary, the system has become extremely fragile because of the high probability that the snowballing uh, effect, that the chain reaction may actually happen within the, uh, within the, uh, the system. I, I, was, I was reading yesterday uh, uh, an article, in that case, by an, by an economist, Mr. Um, Hans-Werner Zinn, if I'm right about his, his name, um, making a parallel between the Eurozone currently and the um, situation at the very end of the um, international monetary order that collapsed. It was started in 1944 at Bretton Woods, but uh, collapsed in 1971. And um, I think his article is revealing in that um, 
economists now become aware of these um, point of views, these standpoints on the uh, physicists and, and start looking at issues uh, within that part, a particular type of perspective. Uh, I don't think he would have been able to do that. Um, I mean, that comparison between very detailed, but in, 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 I would say a systemic type of comparison uh, between the international mon monetary order in 1971 and the um, current situation of the um, of the Eurozone, a subject that I will evoke in, fr in front of the um, European Parliament uh, tomorrow af afternoon. Um, another issue that the uh, regulator has to take in uh, consideration and that they're working on in a very, um, with a lot of emphasis, is the um, an, an inherent uh, fragility, frailty of the um, financial system due to the operation of what we call intermediation, the meeting of people who borrow money with the uh, people who are lending money. As, as you know, our, um, the lending system, which has been organized around the um, banking system, is such that it's not what is called sometimes a 100% uh, system. Um, the, the phrase 100% uh, system was introduced by a, an economist in the 19, 1920s or 30s called Ir Irving Fisher in the United States. And he was a proponent of a 100% system. What is a 100% system? It's a system where the, um, the bank when it's taking assets, like typically of a customer who's uh, got an, uh, an account um, where money has been, has been put in order to m make some operations or to save some money uh, provisionally or to allow businesses to pay you a salary, a wage uh, through the, uh, the banking system, like it's, it's become uh, customary and even legal with, within most countries, which is that um, above a certain amount uh, for transfers like, um, like wages, um, they need to go through the banking system. The money is not given to you as a, as a check or um, as an amount of, um, of cash, but it goes through the, uh, the banking, banking system. And as you may know, the bank is allowed to lend the money that you've put on your account. Why? Because in fact, by having the money in the bank, you've actually, and this is something that people sometimes doubt or tell me it's not true, but it is the case in every country that, to my knowledge, that when you put money in the bank, the property of that money uh, is um, being released from you. It doesn't belong to you anymore. Um, the bank has to give you, needs to reckon that there's a debt there incurred it needs to recognize the, um, that there is a debt from the bank towards you because you're putting that money into the account. And to some extent, the statement that the, the bank gives you that you can find, that you receive by mail, or that you can find now through um, the internet, that statement is a recognition by the bank that it owes you the money which is, is there. But technically speaking, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It has to by law, it has to return it to you if you ask for it, but it has the possibility to actually uh, lend out that, um, that money. How do banks do that? Well, typically they do some statistical analysis of how long people keep uh, money on their uh, account, and uh, they deal with that money on accounts, I would say, as, a, as bulk. I mean, all the money from the accounts is, is regarded as uh, together. Why? Because if you, they keep some money um, in reserve, and they have to do that in, 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 to some extent legally, I mean, stat in a statutory way, by ha leaving some reserves for the money which is um, uh, there on the accounts uh, with the central bank. But it will look at how long people typically keep uh, money on their account. They will, they will decide that it's, uh, you know, on the average 21, 21 days. I'm just giving a, a figure uh, for, you know, every uh, euro or dollar or whatever you put on, on the bank that on the average it will stay there for 21 days. And it will take in, that into account and lend some money out um, to other, other people. 
if you don't leave it for 21 days, if you go back the following day and you, uh, or you, you, know, you write a check or you uh, make a uh, transfer or whatever, and um, it has to find, the bank has to find the money there. It can't tell you it's, 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 it's not there. But it is known that not all the money, the 100% system would be like a vault, simply where you put that in a vault in a safe, and that uh, the money is there and it doesn't, that doesn't get out. And Fisher and some, some other people uh, claim that that would be the only safe system. It's true, it would be the only entirely safe system. And recently in the literature, even the two, uh, two researchers from the International Monetary Fund have come up again with that um, approach and have suggested maybe we should uh, go, go back to that. But the fact is, it's not the way that uh, things operate. And that means that when there's a doubt developing about the capacity of a bank to return the money that's been put there on, uh, on accounts, um, that may be extremely different, uh, uh, dangerous for the, for, the, for the system as a whole. Uh, I did work in the United States, in California, with a, a, a bank called IndyMac Bank. It was specialized in a certain type of, um, it was called Alt-A uh, loans. It was not subprime, but it was not too different from uh, subprime. I, I won't go into the details what was Alt-A. Alt and uh, in the period of uh, 2008, uh, a panic developed and the um, and people started crowding in the, in the streets there in Pasadena uh, to, to get their, their, their money back. It started on a, on a Thursday. Uh, on a Friday, there was uh, some police to have people lining up in order to claim their, their money back. And over the weekend, the bank was seized by the government, by the FDIC. And uh, when it reopened on mon Monday, I haven't seen it. I wasn't, I wasn't there at the time, but I saw pictures. It was in the Mac bank. But between the IndyMac and the bank, there was IndyMac Federal Bank with a banner showing that it was from then on um, the U.S. government. It didn't stay like that. It's gone back to being a, a, a private, uh, a private company after things after the turmoil. <coughs> Excuse me. But the fact is that the whole banking system all over the world is extremely sensitive to that. This is a real serious uh, doubt, a serious um, threat to the system as, as a whole. It's there per, in, in a permanent way. Um, in France, I think it was in 2009, um, it, a famous uh, football player, uh, Cantona, Eric Cantona, was interviewed on the radio, as far as I remember, and he was asked about he was asked about um, how to protest about uh, the um, current situation within the financial system. And he said, if you want to start a revolution, you don't have to go down in the streets with banners and, and, and demonstrate. It's possible now just to bring down the whole financial system uh, by uh, taking your money out of your, of your, your bank account. And um, this was taken very seriously. I mean, showing that uh, it's dangerous for the whole system when people say things like that, especially somebody who's a, um, a people person, a person who's uh, uh, well known. Um, within days, two French ministers um, came to the radio or television to say that this was nonsense, it should be ignored, he didn't know anything about finance. But the fact that two ministers came to um, deny the possibility that it then would happen was actually revealing of how serious a threat of that time uh, is. Um, preventing bank runs, making sure that banks have provisions, and as I mentioned in the case of uh, IndyMac, that if things go wrong, that a bank run is not allowed to develop, I would say it's full course. Not all the money from IndyMac had been taken over that uh, Thursday and, and Friday um, to, to make sure that um, bank runs don't develop into a total panic. Bank runs are famous uh, from, the, um, from the 19th century. A lot of bank runs did, did, did happen. Um, I had the attention drawn recently to the fact that there's a very amusing bank run in, uh, in the movie, uh, the film, uh, Mary Poppins. Uh, where the um, 
by refusing a little boy who wants to keep his uh, toppins in order to buy um, to feed the birds on the uh, steps of St. Paul refuses uh, faced with that crowd of um, menacing, threatening uh, bankers refuse to give his toppence and he starts uh, a, in, um, unwittingly a, a, a bank run within that, uh, that bank. Um, the scene is quite probably, um, this, that's a, um, it looks like it's a very early um, 20th century uh, period, uh, 1910s or something like that, um, but that, um, yes, the, um, it's true that the mother is very involved in the suffragette uh, movement. And, um, <clears throat> but the, the scene is quite revealing what, what happens then. I mean, there's a the rumor that the bank will not be able to refund uh, all, everybody about their, uh, the, the money which is there, and it develops into a, a bank run. For a, more, a much more recent case, uh, when it started being discussed that uh, not all the money in the uh, banks in Cyprus would be returned to the people who had uh, deposited some money there, uh, things of the same type uh, happened. Uh, you, you may remember at the time it was said that um, a translation in financial terms would say that the, uh, the Cyprus euro would be devalued to a value of 90, uh, 90 cents. Um, how it would have been uh, implemented was by, by returning only to people who had um, certain amounts of, uh, on their uh, deposit accounts uh, to return only 90% of the, of, of, of the sum. Um, as you may know, I mean, there's still, a, 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 how would I say, suspicion lingering because the, um, the IMF has mentioned that possible that approach as being a possible approach to a number of uh, uh, issues in the financial world. And as it happened, as, as it developed in Cyprus, which is part of the uh, Eurozone, one of the 17 no, no, um, nations in the Eurozone, um, it is not entirely excluded now, especially since the International Monetary Fund um, is recommending in some cases uh, that this may um, may actually happen elsewhere. I really wonder what's going on in the ne next, next door there. Um, I guess we need to get used to um, that enthusiasm. Um, I, I mentioned, um, I don't know if it's last time or the, the time before, um, a, per, a, a personal experience I had with the, um, with the regulator uh, when I, um, somebody is going to inquire. Yeah. To okay. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> For people watching the video uh, later on. It's a very big thing. There's no possibility to negotiate. Okay, no, I'm just <laughs> come in, take a shape. Can we all go? If we all go. <laughs> So I'm explaining for the people watching the video later on is that there's a, there's a big music, there's a very loud music uh, next door, but apparently it's in the big tent which is there in the, on the lawn. So um, I'll, keep on, I'll keep on talking. I, I mentioned last time an experience, um, a personal experience I had with a regulator when um, I, I will recap it for those of you who are not there. When working in a, in a, in a Dutch bank, I was where I had a, I would say, a critical role to play because I was, um, I was in a position to decide whether or not a new piece of software could be implemented within the um, banking system. system. It was um, what's called uh, value at risk. It was a, a new norm to evaluate uh, gauge risk, which was being implemented. And um, I had realized that the, the, the software we were using uh, was making errors, um, errors which were not simply on figures used for risk management, which would not have an, any implication for the actual running of the business on day-to-day, on day-to-day uh, day -day operations. But it looked like uh, errors were made about products that the bank had, that they were mis mispriced, <clears throat> and um, and I was approached at a party by. Uh, Christmas party, I was approached by a person who said he um, asked me first if I knew who he was, and I said no, I didn't know who he was. Then he said his name, and I recognized his name as being the number two or number three person on, on, on the bank. And he told me to, um, to stop, um, how would I say, to, um, 
stop interrupting the process by saying that we needed to go to the um, nitty-gritty nitty of, the, of the issue. And um, quite furious, he told me, when I, when I had replied to him that it was important towards the um, regulator that we had the figures right, and he said, no, you don't understand, young man, that it's not the way that things operate. I'm going to tell the regulator what are the figures, and that will be it, he said. And then he, he, mo he moved away. Uh, drawing my attention, which had not been drawn to the issue that far, uh, to the actual power balance existing, at least in that particular country. But it might be, you know, Aristotle tells you always not to de derive any consequences from a single example. Um, but uh, it may be revealing from uh, what's happening in other countries. It, I happened to then work for 12 years in the uh, American system, and I discovered that uh, things were and I never was faced with such a blatant, a blatant um, case, but I do know that at some point where there were recriminations from the regulator we had about the way we were running our business, I was at that point in a somewhat, I wouldn't say junior, but I mean mid-rank position, and I was asked simply to write a letter of, in response which had no implications in terms that we would change our attitude at all towards the issue that was raised, but simply we, that we had to find a way of writing a letter that would keep the regulator quiet from, from then on. Then I had other opportunities to see that that was the way we were dealing with um, complaints from the regulator, that the issue would not, that we would meet and say, how can we change our, our, our behavior, but simply that somebody would be found that knows about the technical issues being raised and find a way to write a letter that would um, make the um, regulator happy. In that particular case, we were doing, um, it was at, at, at Countrywide, the, com the company that was um, um, the main responsible for the, for the uh, downfall of the whole uh, subprime industry. And on rainy days, oh, I don't think I have it here. On rainy days, I always come with my, uh, my, um, my briefcase with the uh, countrywide imprint to um, remember these, uh, these, these times. What we were doing at the time was doing what, what I would call a regulator arbitrage. Uh, you know that um, Fiscal optimization, if you try to change country in order to pay less, less tax, for instance, is sometimes called arbitrage, arbitrage or arbitrage, meaning simply that you try to find um, a place where the price is lower for something that you, you want to acquire uh, than another place. In this case, uh, paying your, your tax, you find a place where it's lower, and then you call it arbitrage. Arbitrage is a proper financial uh, technique where you're trying to spot uh, um, a slight, slight or a big, um, a big um, price difference, and um, you're trying to make um, to make a profit out of this. And, and what, an interesting case that comes to my mind about arbitrage is the uh, to give you an interesting example is that um, a man, a well-known uh, rogue trader. I wonder if the, the phrase rogue trader was not actually uh, designed for his particular case called Nick, Nick Leeson, who was working at the, uh, uh, an investment bank in, the, in, in Britain called Barings Bank, a very old, one of the most ancient banks in, the, in, the, uh, in Great Britain. And he was, is, is, um, he, what he was, he, I mean, like, like in most cases, a kind of legend uh, arose about what he was doing like, like I refer to, you know, when, when people say subprime is just lending money to people who can't repay, I say, well, that's a legend, it's a myth. I mean, it was more complicated than that. The same case with Leeson. Uh, Leeson is often regarded as a, as a, as a, simply as a crook, as a trader, but at, he was doing something very special. He was doing arbit, arbitrage. And um, I give it as an example because what happened was that in Singapore, for some kind, I would say, nationalistic reasons. Um, I, I don't remember all the exact details, but um, in Singapore, people had, an, on, on the financial business, the banks that were there, there was an incentive for their, or even a rule, telling them a set, certain type of operation had to be done in terms of the national debt of Singapore with obligations or bonds of Singapore. 
And that introduced a distortion in the system, the fact that therefore these bonds were not priced in the same way in Singapore as it would be on the open market. Leeson was uh, uh, stationed in, in Japan, and he was making money out of the difference for um, Singapore obligations between the price that was existing for them in, uh, in Singapore and in, in Japan. And then what happened is that he had developed a big position, and suddenly um, there was the Kobe uh, earthquake. And the Kobe earthquake was a major disaster in Japan that disrupted the whole economy for a couple of days. And um, the pricing of these obligations in Japan started holding, going haywire, going all over the place, and his position uh, collapsed. As you see, I mean, this is all right. I mean, he was doing very, something very specific, but I, I wouldn't say that he, would, he can be called a crook uh, about what he was doing. He was called a crook for the reason why Monsieur Carviel is also called, called a crook, or Mr. Um, Ixil uh, in, uh, for J.P. Morgan, because he makes, they make a lose, and they make them, their banks lose a lot of money. But what they do is essentially what their colleagues are supposed to do, and themselves too. And um, in some circumstances, because what they're doing is dangerous as such, well, just the, the danger materializes, and therefore major losses are being uh, uh, incurred. I mentioned also, I mentioned two cases, um, Mr. Robert Rubin and Miss um, uh, Wendy Graham last time, about what is called regulator capture. What is called re regula regulator capture is when the um, a regulator is actually um, he or she. I mentioned a, a, a male case and a female case um, is actually working for the benefit of a um, forthcoming uh, employer. There is a strategy being developed to do something which will be of use to a, an institution that will actually turn out to be your future um, employer. I gave the case of uh, um, Rubin about uh, the fact that he removed a particular um, rule that was essentially beneficial for um, City, Citibank at the time, that allowed Citibank to become Citigroup by merging with um, the Travelers um, Insurance Company. And after, I think it was only six months later, um, Mr. Rubin uh, resigned from government and became one of the major uh, main executives of, um, of Citigroup. The, the case I mentioned about Ms. Uh, Wendy Graham was that she was at the um, head of the um, CFTC, Commodities and Futures uh, Trading Commission. And um, she prevented any um, regulation of uh, derivatives, derivative uh, financial uh, instruments uh, for the energy sector, and then was um, immediately after appointed at the, um, at the, um, on the board of the Enron company, which was a company who would, the main company that would benefit from the, uh, um, the absence of regulation in that particular uh, sector. There's a, and you, you will, if you look into the documents which are being assembled as um, the um, documentation relative to the courses here, you will see that there's a volume that's been devoted, devoted to regulator, uh, regulator uh, capture, which essentially denies. It's a set of chapters written. Uh, it's a collective book uh, by a set of uh, people who essentially deny that regulator capture happens. Uh, the thesis of the book is that that the functions of the regulator, which I, I mentioned, information, preventing systemic risk, um, managing bad assets, and preventing bank run, that these are, by essence, not necessarily compatible, that there might be contradiction between them, and that what is usually called a regulator capture is actually simply the surface effect of the conflict uh, between the duties of the regulator. There are some cases which seem to, I would say, illustrate that there might be in particular conflicts between different types of regulators. Uh, um, 
the SEC in the United States, um, Securities and Exchange Commission, has some duties. The CFTC I just mentioned, which is for the uh, essentially for derivatives, as as another mission. And it may happen that sometimes there are conflicts between the missions. That the implication of a certain type of rules would actually conflict with uh, uh, the implication of some other rules. Um, but as the two examples I gave you. Um, of actual regulator uh, capture uh, suggest um, there is evidence that regulator capture uh, happens. Some other cases are interesting. I mean, I, w I will mention two. One was, um, I think his first name is Edward. Yeah, I think it's Edward Gramlich. Gramlich is spelled G-R-A-M-L-I-C-H. He was a university professor in the United States. Um, he's one of the very few people who wrote books about subprime in the period before 19, uh, 2007, when the start started in the, uh, in the sector. I do think there's a, a small book by him published in 2006, if I remember well. He drew the attention of um, Alan Greenspan, who was there at the end of his mandate of the, uh, as the head of the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States. Uh, his mandate was from 1987 to 2006. And um, in, the, in the final period, he was alerted by Gramlich, who was within the federal system. He was the head of one of the um, no, excuse me, I think he had resigned from that position before. Um, when he alerted Alan Greenspan, I don't think he was anymore at the head of one of the Federal Reserves and was in the, one of the regional uh, Federal Reserves within the system, but he had been. And he alerted uh, Greenspan on the, um, on the danger developing, and, um, and Greenspan refused to, refused to act. Um, if, if if Greenspan had reacted, things would have been different. Not entirely different, because I will mention something else um, as part of uh, later developments in that, in that uh, lecture today, uh, but they would have been uh, different. Another famous case is um, the case of um, Brooksley Bourne. Brooksley is spelled, it's her first name, um, B-R-O-O-K-S-L-E-Y, Bourne like the, um, like the physicist um, born, B-O-R-N. At, at a different period than Ms. Gramlich, uh, Brooksley Born had been also head of the CFTC, actually in the period 1996 to 1999. And um, she tried to draw the attention of, um, of the financial authorities in the United States about the need to regulate uh, financial derivatives. Um, I don't think I've given a definition of derivative so, so far. The derivative is a financial instrument, the value of which is derived from that of an, another uh, in, instrument. Um, the product which is from which the derivative derives its value is called the underlying, the underlying product. And the underlying product is a product which has a, uh, um, an intrinsic value. It can be sold as a uh, commodity, like, uh, for instance, a, uh, ins a debt instrument, an obligation. And um, a good example of a derivative would be a um, credit default swap which is an insurance, I put insurance between uh, inverted commas because uh, you don't need to be actually exposed to the risk to be able to insure yourself against, against an existing risk. But the value of the uh, uh, CD, CDS, credit default swap, is the loss you would incur on a particular uh, debt instrument. So you insure yourself against that possible loss. A possible loss on, a, on a, um, that instrument is of a double nature. Uh, the person to whom you, had, uh, you have lent money may refuse or not be in a position to uh, 
reimburse, refund either the, the whole amount or a part of the amount, and that would be a credit, so-called credit risk. You wouldn't be paid what you are supposed to have right to, and uh, or that the um, or that the um, interest payments which have been promised are not being uh, paid. Uh, you remember for, uh, it's actually a few weeks ago, uh, when there was a question around the possible default of the United States. The question was not so much in the immediate future of the U.S. not refunding uh, instruments, but that some interest payments would not take place, which would then be called within the um, vocabulary of, of credit default swap, would be called a cre credit event. The credit event is what um, gets a right to a reimbursement through a, a credit a default swap. People had create credit default swaps, let's say, on, a, on an American ob obligation, which some, some do not allow you uh, interest pay payments, interest cash flows. Why? Why? Because often the uh, interest payments have been discounted from the price you've been paid. So therefore, the interest payment don't need to be uh, made as, as promised because the, um, the, the amount you paid for the obligation took already into account the fact that there won't be interest payment. Um, a credit event, therefore, gives you a right to a, um, to a uh, particular pay payment and a non-payment of interest rate in that case would have been a credit event and a credit um, deferred swap would have been exercised, which is the word which is, uh, uh, is, is being used. Um, I think that last year there was one particular lecture that was devoted um, only to derivatives, but this won't be the case this, this year. Uh, in that family of products, I won't enter into the detail, you have futures, uh, which are um, a payment for something that will be delivered in the, in the, the future, uh, swaps, and swaps which are essentially exchanges between promises made by two different parties. Uh, like let's say for, at, at, some, with, at some specific periodicity, like every six months, payments will be made by two parties um, when it's an interest swap. Um, one of the party will pay a fixed amount of interest on a particular amount, like let's say five, um, five euros over an amount of 100 euros that had been lent. That would be, and one party would pay every time, every six months would pay five, five euros. And the other party would pay a um, floating rate. And the floating rate would be determined by a, the market. And it may typically, let's say, when, when you start an interest rate swap, you do it such that the uh, floating amount is the same amount, as the, sa the same floating level of the rate is the same as the fixed one. So on a particular day, you decide to have an interest rate swap over a period of five years, and uh, the rate is 475. Well, the fixed rate then is fixed for the whole five years, for the per party that will pay for, for a fixed rate will be fixed at 475. Every, if the amount of the swap, of course, the, uh, the amount is never 100 euros or 100 dollars, but if it were uh, 100, every time one of the party would pay 475 euros or dollars to the other party. The other one would pay what has become the floating rate in the market, the, the rate which is determined by the operation of the market. And one month it will be 470, another month it will be, uh, every, I said it's every six months, one time it would be 470, and in, in that case the party who's paying 475 would be at a loss and the party who's paying 470 would gain uh, five, um, five, five cents. Another time it will be 480, and then the party who's paying fixed would actually benefit from receiving uh, 480 instead of 475. As you see, the amounts are settled on the, on the difference between the, 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 the two amounts. That's another t type of, of swaps. Swaps can be of interest rate, can be of very different nature. Uh, there are um, uh, currency swaps. And a currency swap, let's say that um, on a particular day, uh, the dollar is, um, the, 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 the euro, uh, 
1.23 euros is worth, um, no, excuse me, um, how do you say that? Uh, that one dollar is one divided by <laughs> 1.23 uh, euros, or is, um, I don't know, uh, 85 cents to the, the, the euro. <coughs> and then you make a swap, and on the first day, there's an exchange that doesn't take place because they would, you would exchange amounts in different uh, um, currencies that would be equivalent, so it doesn't take place. But then, according to the fluctuations of the, um, of the exchange rate in the um, five years, typically, every six months, there would be payments. And because of the um, exchange rate having um, fluctuated over the period, one of the parties would pay more, actually, uh, than, uh, than the other. That would, these are uh, swaps, exchange, uh, uh, currency, currency swap. Um, another interesting Another, in, I, I wrote a little, little note. I mean, the justification for uh, re, rebuking uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Bourne uh, in the uh, at the time because she didn't go anywhere with her regulation of the um, um, of the derivatives. She was even, how would I say, actually being ostracized and persecuted. I mean, she had a very hard time. Um, for having uh, suggested that type of regulation. She was opposed not only by Mr. Rubin and Mr. Greenspan, but also by Mr. Lawrence uh, Summers, who's been the uh, losing candidate recently to um, the replacement of Mr. Um, ben Bernanke at the head of the, um, the successor of, um, of um, Alan Greenspan at the head of the um, Federal Reserve. The justification these people gave to um, they didn't mention, of course, that it would be hired later on by people who would make, uh, allow them to make a lot of money out of, out of that. Um, and I, I should mention also uh, Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Greenspan, who's you know, very much responsible for the collapse of the subcrime crisis. Not that he would have actively created it, but by refusing to uh, the good suggestion made, made by a variety of people to, to try to prevent it. Um, he joined right away in 2008, as far as I remember. He joined uh, uh, the hedge fund of Mr. Paulson, who was the person who's, um, there's even an article again to, about him in the uh, Wall Street Journal today. Uh, Mr. Paulson, who's the, the main hedge fund that made, I think, as far as I remember, was $6 billion out of the collapse of the, um, of the um, subprime sector. Now it's a bit strange again that Mr. Greenspan would, who was responsible, whose responsibility was to prevent an event of, of that nature, uh, would join a company that benefited from having, uh, uh, for betting on the collapse of the, of the industry. When I'm face, faced by people, uh, who say, well, it's impossible to find anybody who was responsible from the subcrime uh, crisis. Um, well, I've already mentioned the names of Mr. Rubin, Mr. Summers, Mr. Greenspan. Um, it's not that difficult to find the names of these, these people. I'll, I'll give an, even, um, not names, but another institution I'll mention that was uh, very instrumental in creating that, that crisis. The fact is that there's no law that would um, allow to indict them for what what's been going on? Uh, it, it would have possible if 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 a cre if a um, committee was created, like in the 1930s, the so-called PECORA, P-E-C-O-R-A um, committee. The name of a uh, I think it was a senator, American senator. Um, there was a um, there was a, um, a commission, or a committee being uh, brought together to find who was responsible for the uh, Great Depression, and. Um, some people were indicted in relation to that. There was a, um, there was a similar attempt in, in, in 2008. I don't remember exactly who was the, the name of the person who was responsible for the, the fact is he didn't leave his name. He was the, um, he was the um, financial controller of California as, as far as I remember. But his name is, is um, doesn't come to my mind, which is revealing for, for the fact that uh, that committee didn't go anywhere really in uh, finding the, 
and defining who was um, responsible for what what had um, had, had happened. It would what would be needed to indict people like that would be, a, let's say, a, 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 something like a, a Russell Tribunal. I mean, some, you know, you would do that, uh, people from the civil society would get together and decide that some, some crime has been committed and try to uh, establish a separate kind, an, an independent committee, which wouldn't have any really enforcing uh, power, of course, but would be able to go into the causes of uh, what happened and, the, and the, decide who, um, who is responsible for what, what happened. The justification of these, these people in the case of the um, um, rebuking Miss um, Brooks Lee Bourne was that she was, she, by, by regulating uh, derivatives, uh, it would have stifled financial innovation. And um, here we go back to one of, one of the recurrent theme, I would say, of, of, of my lectures, um, the responsibility of, of uh, flawed economic theory in, uh, in, in, in the decisions which are being made. It is part of the mainstream um, <clears throat> economic theory, the one with names like uh, Mr. Markor Mar Markowitz, uh, Debre, Arrow, these people, all these people who've been building that, uh, that um, the core of that current economic theory, Mr. Eugene Farmer, uh, who just had a, um, uh, with, uh, been sharing the uh, Nobel Prize in, in economics. Um, all these people have developed a theory which has as implication um, that new financial instruments, whatever they are, uh, contribute to market perfection and that therefore there's no, how would I say, it would be heretical in terms of economic theory to suggest that a, uh, a new uh, financial uh, product would be uh, dangerous for the, the system. This is of course before there was any discussion of systemic risk. I think it would be possible now for a new financial uh, type of uh, instrument to say, well, no, this introduces uh, risk, <coughs> uh, a systemic risk, which is the case actually uh, for nearly every um, derivative instrument. It's only by restricting the use of these instruments that you can prevent uh, systemic risk. Like typically, um, you can, um, you, ca you could, I mean, through rules, prevent some type of actors to come on these markets if their intervention would mean that the, uh, that the systemic risk, the global systemic risk is increased by their, their allowing them there to come there. Typically, uh, let's say on the, on the market of, um, I don't know, say a future, a future market for wheat, <clears throat> if you let just pure speculators to come on that market, People who have no grain to deliver, no grain to, uh, no capacity for um, receiving and storing uh, grain. Um, if you prevent those people who have no capacity of being an actual, uh, what's, uh, what's called uh, a com com commercial, um, you would diminish, you would reduce the uh, systemic risk. Um, I, I mentioned last time that uh, rules have been, were introduced recently by the last year by the CFTC uh, to prevent that type of risk by restricting uh, access to these uh, uh, commodity markets, future markets uh, to, serve, to people who are pure speculator and that the measure was immediately stopped by um, these people, the speculators gaining in the court um, a decision in their favor, uh, in making it impossible to, um, to actually uh, regulate the, the sector. Now the fact is that nothing can be proved now, and not only by uh, by methods designed by uh, physicists that uh, systemic risk exists, and that no, uh, I mean that a financial, a new financial product needs to be examined for its own merits, and if it's introducing systemic risk either as an instrument as such, or if some particular economic agents use it that it shouldn't be prevented from uh, being, being, being used. Uh, I think a typical example is the, the CDO, the, and a particular synthetic CDO, um, collateralized debt obligation for which no good method exists for assessing the risk that a product of that nature is introducing. And uh, that would be one of my criteria. If no mathematical method is known 
for assessing the risk of a new financial product. It should not be, uh, should not be allowed because you cannot make provisions for a particular risk if that risk cannot be measured. That's, um, I think it makes elementary, um, elementary sense. The difficulty is that in the case of the CDO and the synthetic CDO is that the um, rating agencies claimed, claimed that they knew how to calculate it, although there was agreement among uh, our profession of uh, financial engineers that there was no method to do that. Then, when the whole thing collapsed, uh, Standard & Poor's, how would I say, confessed, confessed. They say, well, actually, it was true that we had no method for um, calculating risk on these products. But what can you do then? I mean, it's very nice to have that confession, but it doesn't make any difference. They're not either punished or anything or even reprimanded for uh, having done it uh, while they knew that they couldn't, couldn't be done. In uh, an, another an interesting case for the um, relationship uh, between um, regulator and the industry is what happened in uh, March and April 2009. It's the case of the um, FASB rule 157 that led to an actual physical fight in the uh, in a senatorial uh, committee in the uh, commission in the uh, United States. Um, FASB are the initials for uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board, the board that, definish, that determines the standards of, the, of accounting for the financial world. <clears throat> and FASB is, writes rules and these are known by their, their number. There's a f famous um, rule 133, which I often mentioned, because when people say it's impossible to define speculation, I say, well, FASB 133 explains in a couple of paragraphs the difference between speculation and non-speculation. Um, why does it do it? Because there's a taxation of operations which are purely speculative, uh, while operations which are not speculative, which are reducing risk within the system, which is called hedging, um, do not have to pay uh, tax on these, on these operations. So if you wanted to prevent speculation, well, instead you could use these paragraphs and say, instead of saying, well, there's a higher tax on, on this type of operation, you would simply say, well, these operations are forbidden. You people should not be, should be doing that. <clears throat> so what was FASB 157? When you do accounting for a financial product, you have to put in your books, and your books, I mean, the purpose of your books is essentially telling the public what is the current health of your company, of a corporation. It tells what it, you know, the assets it has, the liabilities, meaning the money it owns to somebody else. Uh, and there's an evaluation, which is typically every, every term or every quarter, um, the terms being synonym. Um, every three months, a company make a, makes a statement about its current, uh, current health. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> what you assign as the value of a product that you, that you bought, there's something called book value. Book value is the price you paid. But typically, the price you paid may not be very um, representative of the actual value of the product that you have. Let's say you bought a car for 16,000 uh, euros back in 2008. Well, that's five years ago. You can't resell or regard the value of your car being the exact price that you, you paid, if only because they're taxed there or something else, uh, things that you could not, not be able to recoup. There's a notion of amortizing, means that the value, there's a devaluation of the product, a depreciation, which is just due to um, um, wear and tear, the fact that the product you know, it loses its value because it's not as good as before. Some products gain value. Uh, a painting by Rubens gains value with time, uh, <clears throat> but that's untypical. Typically, a product loses value. So if you try to assess your uh, 
the value of your company. And I have on one side a company who uh, bought uh, equipment for one million back in 1996, and another company that got acquired equipment in 2012 for the same amount of one million, where the two companies on that in that particular in that particular respect are not worth the same value uh, because there is depreciation, which is not noticeable, and um, for the case of the company with the older older equipment. So how do you how do you determine the value of a, of a financial of a financial product? Well, you may you may say that let's say it's an obligation, an obligation. Uh, you um, you you are entitled that in 2020 you will be paid by some government an amount of one million euros because that's the value of the of the obligation. <coughs> It should be justified that you will regard that that value is what you will put in your book. And say, well, it will be worth that particular amount on that partic at that particular time, and there's no current doubt that it will be repaid, and therefore that's the um, that's the value. There are things which dep depreciate, and then you should you should calculate the depreciation and, and put that into into your uh, books. And there are also things that may have a value that fluctuates from day, day to day. I mentioned you know, the fact that there are floating rates. Let's say that you um, acquired an obligation uh, for, um, which had a coupon of uh, 3%, meaning that every year you were received as a, as a cash flow, a cash flow of uh, linked to interest of 3% of the, the value of your obligation. But let's imagine now that the obligations being issued by the same government are, have a coupon of 7%. Well, in that case, it's much more interesting to uh, lend money to that government acquiring the uh, obligation and receiving 7% than, uh, than receiving 3 And that means that the obligations that are in the market that can be resold and that have a coupon for 3% Will have less value than one than those current that with seven percent. So the price for the product as a commodity that can be purchased will be less, and the, the price can be calculated. There will be a discount. The difference between seven percent and three percent will be discounted from the value of the uh, of the product. Just like in the sales, uh, if there's a little spot of, on, on, on some piece of clothing, well, it will be depreciated in the, so, in the sales, uh, taking into account that little, uh, the, that particular flaw. Now, as far as accounting is concerned, and this, it's about the same uh, in every country, but I, I'll use it, the terminology which is used in the, um, in the United States. <clears throat> when you have financial products and you have to, in the, uh, in your, um, quarterly balance, you have to assess their value. There are three possibilities. There are three categories in which these products can be put. One, one category is called trading, and that means that tomorrow or in five minutes or in the coming week, that product can be sold by you. There's another category called available for sale, which seems to be linked to that it could be even be understood as being a, a, um, a synonym for it. Available for sale is meaning that you are not in a position where you can actually sell it within the coming minutes. It's something that you, may con that you are considering possibly, let's say in the six months that will come, as a product you may want to, um, you may want to, sell, to sell. And there's a third category, which is called health for invest investment. Help for investment is what I refer to um, as equivalent to um, book value. It is essentially the value it has as a product that can be sold uh, for the amount which has been promised to be sold at some particular point in, in time. That's called in help for investment. <clears throat> now, let's take a situation like the, um, let's say we are on the 1st of April 2007. Well, why to 1st of April 2007? Well, essentially because in February 2007, the value of the subprime um, securities 
these bundles of individual subprime mortgages bundled together into a um, security, an asset-backed security, which was the, the name used for subprime, um, subprime uh, securities. <coughs> it could have been called also um, MBSs, mortgage-backed securities, but for some historical reason, uh, mortgage was only associated to the, sub, to the prime mortgages and um, the term asset-backed securities, which applies to other type of products like um, plain leases, things of that, that type, uh, or uh, you know, uh, money borrowed to uh, build a uh, golf course, etc., could be bundled together into asset-backed securities. Now, in August, in August 2007, the subprime crisis becomes public because the, the, um, there's no business anymore. People not only don't sell and buy subprime loans and uh, subprime uh, um, securities and anymore at all, but the, um, the um, lending and borrowing between um, banks themselves stops because a lack of trust, of confidence between banks over, all over the world about the quality of their portfolios that might, that might contain asset-backed securities with uh, subprime, subprime loans. So, but I choose that time of the 1st of April uh, because I'm between the very beginning of, this, of the, the crisis in February 2007 and the time when the market disappears altogether. There's no price, people say, anymore. There's no price. Why isn't there any price? Well, there is a price. There's a price at which people want to sell um, mortgage, uh, mortgage-backed securities with subprime loans, and there's not a price at which people are prepared to, to buy it. But there's such a difference between what people say, well, I want to sell at that price, and what people say, well, I, I'm only prepared to buy it. There's no commerce anymore because that's too wide a spread between what is called ask and bid. The bid is the price being um, proposed by somebody who's prepared to buy, and the ask is the price uh, re re requested by somebody who's prepared to, uh, to, to sell. So you have a portfolio of uh, subprime, uh, subprime l l uh, titles, securities. How are you going to price them in your, the balance? in the balance, your balance sheet and in the figures that you will release as a quarterly uh, statement for, for your uh, company. If these subprime loans are part of trading, well, you have to put as a value the value it has on the market. And the difficulty is there is that there are still very few people um, prepared to buy it, and therefore the price is very low. Price is very low. So you would, if it's part of that category, your company has to define for every things in this portfolio, it has to define beforehand in, what, in, in which of these uh, three categories uh, trading available for sale and how for investment where it wants to, to put it beforehand. It can't just decide on the day that the statement is being, being written. If these titles were, if these securities were in trading, they had to be put in the book at the current price, which would be a, a majorly uh, depreciated uh, price. <clears throat> if, it, if they were held for investment, I, I'm keeping uh, provisionally the available for sale um, in suspense, um, held for investment, well, you could say, I don't know what will happen between now and the time where it's supposed to be fully be, uh, repaid. It looks like it's junk now, but God knows, uh, you know, maybe things will get better. It's quite interesting that the attitude at that time of the Chinese government was precisely that. It wouldn't acknowledge any possible loss on subprime. It said, you know, we're China and uh, we have time before us, so we're not going to regard any, put any depreciation in the value of our products. It changed later on, it, the attitude. Uh, the attitude of China uh, changed, but at that time that I'm talking about, that's the attitude is set. Book value, book value for uh, subprime, uh, subprime uh, securities, because you know we told that this will be repaid sometime in 2020 or 25. We don't care. We have time bef before us. Then, as you know, they became incensed when they realized um, how bad the situation was. Now let's imagine that you have in, in the third category that you have available for sale 
um, some of these subprime loans. Are you going to try price them as if you were actually holding them forever until the maturity, or will you be um, pricing them at the price, which is the current market price, which would show possibly that your company is insolvent, that you have financial, major financial difficulties. Now, it happened that in 2005, I do believe, FASB rule 157 had said that all products in all categories had to be priced at market price. So no book value for subprime loans, everything, everything subprime had to be priced from then on at the market value. And that meant that any financial establishment, any financial organization that had a considerable amount of these subprime loans on their, in, in their portfolio would possibly be insolvent. So what happened, and that's why, I mean, this is an interesting case of a relationship between regulator and, um, and financial uh, businesses is what happened on the 12th, 12th of March 2009, a financial subcommittee of the American Senate called the representatives of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, and asked them to explain why it was maintaining that um, notion of everything being, par uh, being priced at mark to market, meaning the market price, which in, the, um, in that um, FASB 157 rule was called a just value, just like the notion of a just price, which is a notion which comes from, the, uh, from scholastics, from uh, um, from uh, philosophy in the, in the Middle Ages, where some of the uh, uh, thinkers of the time, in particular Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, had um, been discussing the notion of a just value. Now, in times where everything is, is I would I say, in times of, of plenty in the economy, when prices are going up constantly, it is very nice for companies to be able to use market price, because that makes them look very good. It turned out that we were then, in, in March 2009, we were uh, six months after the major crash in the financial world. And if you had to actually um, price everything at the price that the market was prepared to pay for these uh, product which had become acquired junk status, a lot of financial establishment would have to reveal that actually their liabilities were higher uh, than their assets, meaning that they were technically in a, in a state of bankruptcy. So what happened is that the, um, in a room like this, you had the senators on one side, and you had the people from the FASB sitting in the uh, audience, and they were told by the senators that they had to change the rules. They had to make it possibly, you know, everything being rather close to being held for investment in order to boost the, the figures. Now, it was, there are videos of that, and um, it became very unruly. They were shouting people, there some senators were shouting at these people in the, uh, of the FASB. The FASB people said, well, we don't change rules under pressure. This is not the way it, it happens. And um, I think three of the, um, and it's to their, their honor, I would say, three of the uh, leaders of the, um, of the board um, of the FASB resigned in the, in the days after that. But the fact that it's on the 2nd um, of April, which is uh, three weeks later, they changed the rule. FASB changed the rule. And um, on that day, when they changed the rule, there was a 5% rally on the stock exchange in the United States. What, it, what is really amusing, and we mentioned that on my, my blog, there was some minor political event in France on that particular day. And the French press, which at that time in 2009, I would say was not reading any of the Anglo-Saxon financial press at all. It, it's, it's improved by, by now. 
was assigning the, these 5% to that minor political event in France, not being aware that um, something big had happened, which that, let's say, a considerable amount of companies, corporations, which were actually technically insolvent, became solvent again just by a change, uh, change in the rules. Another interesting ex example, I, I will, as I said, I, I will mention something um, before the end of the, uh, of the lecture, and as I'm running a bit short of time, I will mention that one first. Um, I mentioned the, uh, when I mentioned the names of some of the people who, in my mind, are very much responsible of the uh, subprime crisis, I say I will mention one more set of, of, of people. <clears throat> and these people I have in mind are the um, Mortgage Bankers Association. Now, mortgage, you understand, that's what's called uh, in Europe a um, um, residential estate uh, loan to acquire um, acquire a, um, a house, some, some lodging. And um, the technical use uh, in the United States is called mortgage, which, as you know, is a, it's an old French um, word, a mortgage. And the term mortgage is even is still used in, 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 in French uh, for some very technical thing of a different nature and within, uh, within French, French law. <coughs> but in the, in, in the um, American system, a mortgage is a... Um, is a lien, as it said, on a, on a house. <clears throat> that it, the system is quite different from the one in, in, in Europe. In, in, in Europe, when you want to buy a house, you take a loan, you get a loan from a bank, and from day one, you're the owner of, of the house. And uh, if anything goes wrong and you cannot pay the money back, refund it, well, you're you're liable for it. I mean, you have to, to be able to re find a, one way or other of paying the money back to the, to the bank. But in the United States, the, the bank remains the owner during the whole period until the last uh, payment has been made on the principal, which is the loan amount, the, the, the amount that's been, that's been borrowed from the, from the bank. And you only get the title to the house on the day that that final uh, payment has been made, typically 30 years in the case of a uh, standard uh, mortgage in the, uh, in, the, in the United States. What happened in the years, let's say 1995 to 2006-7, is that the mortgage, um, the subprime, subprime mortgage industry developed in the, in the United States. And there was one state in, in the United States, North, North Carolina, who saw the danger developing and um, forbid subprime loans. The, um, in Canada, people often say, I mean, bankers in Canada say, look, I mean, we were so much more clever than the um, Americans because we never, uh, we never had a mortgage um, subprime crisis. But the reason is very simple, is that Canada had a, uh, a law that was preventing uh, subprime loans being, being issued, just not like North Carolina um, in the United States. Now, what happened in the years after uh, North, North Carolina passed that, the, that law is that the Mortgage Bankers Association put $500 million on the table to prevent other states from developing that law. Um, how would I put it? Not all the $500 million were used illegally. Uh, some were used legally by, for instance, um, paying some studies that would have shown that by preventing subprime loans being issued, you were uh, doing uh, racial discrimination. Why, Why that, uh, that idea? Well, because as you know, um, subprime loans were sold essentially to minorities in the United States, typically Hispanics and um, Afro-Americans, um, American people. And if there were no subprime, well, it's true that you were reducing the number of people who could have access from these minorities. And some, so some st initially, some studies were paid by the Mortgage Bankers Association uh, for people uh, trying to establish that the, uh, the law about against racial discrimination would be infringed by uh, 
uh, uh, forbidding uh, subprime loans. Quite interestingly, I saw, I read, I read, I read the uh, reports that were paid by the Mortgage Bankers Association when I was preparing my, my, my book uh, where I announced the, uh, you know, when I, I predicted the coming of the subprime crisis. And um, one of these firms, one of the firms who had published one of these studies was non-committal. They said, well, you know, you can say this or that and so on. But one was actually showing that in North Carolina, the proportion of minority people had increased uh, in access to um, housing after the law was, was passed. So they had the nerve, I would say, these people, having received the money from the Mortgage Bankers Association, they had the nerve to show in their study that you no, know, actually it had worked in the opposite uh, direction. But the fact is that these 500 million were, um, did work. They did prevent uh, the, uh, the law in North Carolina from being uh, passed in other states. Uh, quite a large number of, of states. I, I remember something like probably 15 states were seriously uh, considering passing a law like that. So if you look for responsible for the mortgage, uh, for the um, subprime crisis, I would say that the, the names of the um, of the uh, executives of the Mortgage Bank uh, Bankers Association are also people who should definitely be in the list. They knew, they knew that the crisis was um, possible. Why did they know it? Because uh, there were people like me in their banks telling them it would be so in, their, in our report. So they knew it, but they deliberately, for their own advantage, um, decided to prevent the, the measures that could have um, uh, pro by prohibiting uh, such loans uh, had prevented themselves the, um, the, the, the crisis to, to, to develop. I had a, a few other, other examples, but um, I, I will be able to mention them in other, other lectures. There are this f the f five minutes left for uh, questions, if there are any in the, uh, in the audience. I beg your pardon? What was behind the politics in a state like North Carolina to say no, we don't allow us? Well, that's, that's very interesting because uh, I, 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 wonder, I wonder too. And actually, uh, North Carolina, as far as I remember, had a Republican uh, governor at the time. It was a rather, I would say, more Republican leaning state than the other. I do not know exactly why it had taken that particular uh, measure. Um, that would be interesting. To, to find out. Um, I, I know that California was one of those that had considered seriously to, uh, to ban also the, um, well, like, like, like North Carolina. But uh, I, I, no, I didn't find out why particularly in that, uh, in that particular state it had, uh, as, as we know, when we go then and into the details, we find it's all linked probably to one individual who was you know, pushing that and managed to go through the whole, uh, Pass all the the, the uh, defenses and and uh, and manage to to do it. But it would be interesting to 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 find out, yeah, why why it passed it, and uh, also why Canada immediately had. Um, um, when you when I speak to these Canadian bankers, they should you know they assign to their genius the fact that there was no crisis. But no, I mean they they, they had the framework that that prevented it from developing all altogether. Nobody else? All right. Oh, yes, please. Well, there's something to say at the beginning regarding the euro. I thought there was a kind of um, fear that the euro will not survive or there is a new reshuffling of the world politics. My question will arrive on the day, but start somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm a student political science, so my answer is more politically oriented than economic. But mm -hmm. things are linked to the One prediction for the future would be that the world uh, would be based on regionalism, it would be superpowers or big uh, entity like Russia, United States, uh, perhaps United Europe, Brazil, India, and then China, that will lead the economy. This will bring, in terms of monetary policy, to the use of one single currency for each regional entity. Uh, so there will be the rule in Russia, the lower in the United and so on. The question is, what will happen in then another question is what will happen to Africa, because also Africa would be one of the regional policy um, actors. And perhaps there would be one single currency or 
also prepared. The question is, what do you think about the prediction of this uh, analysis in regard to the monetary policy? Will the euro be much more stronger and a powerful currency, knowing that it will be one uh, political entity, mm -hmm. or will it be the other way around? That the fact that the economically, that the European uh, identity will not be able to face the, the challenge, Therefore, the political union will collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's someone here who's uh, writing a thesis very much on that subject. Um, <clears throat> but it, my, my own understanding is the following, is that a collapse of the Eurozone now as it is, and I, I'm just putting between brackets, I mean, all the errors that have been made for why making a Eurozone the way it was made, because it sounds like it's been made by people who had, how would I say, there must have been some element of incompetence because I mean, we know about monetary systems and, and some time bombs have been, were left there unaware. <coughs> anyway, I think a collapse would be so costly um, that the only possibility is that of a, uh, how would I say, to move on in the same direction and try to save the, the, the organization of the Eurozone by putting now all the elements that, would, that are missing. Because other, the, the, a possible reversal to the, um, to the old currencies it is too costly. It, it would lead to default in too many countries all, altogether, either immediately for some, like Ireland, um, or you know, as part of a chain reaction for, for others. If you look at India, at the um, countries among the 17, there are only four which are in a um, healthy condition. Germany, Holland, um, Luxembourg, and Finland. That's four out of 17. Belgium is not, is not in, Belgium is not in a healthy position. France is in a worse position than, 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 than Belgium, but they're all in the red. All the others, than, than, you know, than the four I mentioned are, are in, in the red. <clears throat> what I've been suggesting, and that's probably the reason why I'm asked to, 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 to testify uh, to, tomorrow, is uh, I'm recommending a, a general default of the uh, Eurozone with a, um, a mutualization of the, of the existing debt a devaluation of the euro compared to the other, uh, to the other um, uh, currencies, and a new start with a suggestion, I mean a strong suggestion, that we need to go back to an, an international uh, monetary um, order like existed between 1944 and 1971. The error in 1944 was to accept the idea that one currency, the American dollar, could be at the same time <coughs> the domestic currency for one particular country and at the, at the same time an international um, currency for the rest of, of the world. Why? Because when the system started in 1944, the American economy, which was that of the only country which hadn't I mean, apart from very small countries in some, in some part of the world, but essentially was the main major economy that had not seen any actual fighting on it within the frontiers, the borders of the country, represented about 70% of the, of the um, world economy in, 19, in 1944. So when you were making that, I would say, or simplification, saying, well, the dollar is, can be at the same time um, the, the currency for the United States and for the whole world, it represents 70 percent. It was not so much of an approximation. What people should have realized that there would be a time like now where the American economy represents a quarter of the world economy, not any more 70 percent, and that all what we call euro dollars, which are dollars which are used as a reference currency um, for the um, world um, commerce, would be a money which has no, which has two purposes, representing the actual wealth of one single country and representing part of the wealth of the whole world. Now, in 1971, we 
Nixon decided that that order was over, essentially because the pegging of the um, the pegging of the um, dollar on the uh, on a certain amount of, of uh, gold had become totally unbalanced. It didn't represent at all the 35 35 uh, dollar for an ounce of of, of gold. And um, but what what happened is that. For 40 years now, there hasn't been any international monetary order. So I've been recommending that we do a new Bretton Woods. I mean, I, I started saying that in 2007, along with some other people. We need a new international monetary order. And within that new one, we could really actually rebuild a new Eurozone that would correspond to one of the existing zones. And it would be possible. When, when John Maynard Keynes suggested that in 1944, you know, what his proposal was not, not, not accepted, it was rejected. But he was su suggesting that we should organize a um, economic organization of the whole world that would be balanced. He called it a pacification of, 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 uh, of, the, of the economy, where every of these economic zones corresponding to a particular currency would have a balanced. Um, relationship to all the other, other parties. Quite, in, quite interestingly, I, I, I realized reading an article, the article I, I mentioned by that uh, German uh, co person called Zinn, that within the United States, within the United States, there is a system like that between the different federal districts, such that if economic relationships be become unbalanced between these different districts, every year in April, there's a rebalancing being, being made. Those who owe money to some others will get less of a, out of a portfolio, which is still pegged, bizarrely, pegged on gold. <laughs> and there's a rebalancing being done. And it's, that system is actually very much the one that uh, John Maynard Keynes had uh, suggested for the whole world, and which I think would be a, would be a system that, that would work. And the fact that it works within the United States is good evidence, and has been working uh, for quite, quite, quite a while, is good evidence that a system like that would, would work. That implies a certain solidarity between the different parts. Uh, California has to give some money to Alabama within that system every year. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the price to pay, and it's a nice price to pay for the whole system working together. Um, yes? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. No. <laughs> no. Bitcoin is something that nightclub owners uh, organize between them to 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 speculate on the on the stupidity of other people. But uh, but drug dealers use that. Huh? Drug dealers use that. Cost. Yeah, they do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they th they have a good business. Eh? But. Yeah, but I mean, the, uh, in, in, within, within the proposal by, by Keynes, it was called the Bancor, B-N-C-O-R. And there was another word, uh, Unitas. At some point in, in their reports, they were using another name for that, that money to do be an account money for the whole world called Unitas or, or Bancor. When in discussions now, people you know, call that the whole problematic there, call it, um, uh, call it the bank, Bancor, a reflection on, on the Bancor. And the, these, um, I would say, these um, um, financial instruments pegged to the, the, the dollar, to the, excuse me, to gold within the American system, are is in fact like the equivalent of a bank or within the uh, that organization of uh, 18 districts within the United States or 17 districts. No, I think it's 18 districts within the within the United States. Okay, we're going to finish on that note today, and I'll see you. It's not next week. Um, but that's the week, the week after, in, um, in a fortnight. Thank you.